Once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are going to be hearing from a representative who's here tonight from Maine Maritime Museum. And I'm very happy that we are having this collaboration. We're going to be learning a bit about Maine's um, historic connections to the slave trade. Uh, and so I am very, very happy to welcome tonight's presenter. His name is Luke Gates Milardo, and he's the Education and Community Engagement Specialist at Maine Maritime Museum. Um, if you joined us earlier in the week, uh, we had a presentation from the um, Penobscot Marine Museum. So I'm just really, really delighted that we are representing two of our major maritime museums at the Camden Public Library this month as we celebrate Maritime Month. So let me tell you briefly about our presenter this evening. Luke designs and delivers creative experiential learning opportunities for museum goers of all ages. He is particularly interested in using artifacts to emphasize historically underrepresented stories and perspectives, supporting students in reinterpreting their understanding of history through such critical lenses as environmentalism, social justice, and the arts. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Luke. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank you all for tuning in tonight. I'm Luke gates Milardo, and very thankful for the opportunity to speak this evening. So this is going to be a conversation using artifacts and documents from Maine Maritime Museum's collection to shed light on Maine's involvement in the Atlantic slave economy. I'm going to highlight key artifacts from our current exhibit titled Cotton Town to show how we reinterpreted collection items to tell this story. As such, much of my talk will center on artifacts currently on display in the Cotton Town exhibit, which will be up for just another 10 days. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. And then we're going to conclude with a discussion on why this history and other undertold historical narratives matter for the world today. All right, I am going to share my screen now. So let's, oops. let's start off with a quick intro to Maine Maritime Museum to get us started. So we have a collection of artifacts and documents that exceeds 26,000 items. And we are located on the nation's only preserved historic wooden shipyard, which is home to the largest wooden schooner ever built, the schooner Wyoming. Our regularly updated galleries convey the state's maritime heritage from Wabanaki canoe making through the golden age of sail to the current shipbuilding industry happening right next door at Bath Ironworks. I'll note that our collection caters particularly well to Bath's maritime history, but much of my talk, though specific to the shipbuilding industry in Bath, holds true to a large extent for other coastal communities, certainly including Camden. If you're interested in pursuing this history for your own community, there are more and more tools and resources every day to help you conduct research on your own. And I'm definitely happy to share ideas if you'd ever like to reach out to me individually. So I'd like to begin with the documents that first prompted this exhibit. It's a series of letters written by a bath captain on board a bath built vessel transporting enslaved people from Baltimore to New Orleans in October, 1850. Thanks to good work by recent researchers, we knew these types of voyages happened, but finding hard evidence in our collection made it that much more possible for us to convey this aspect of history in an exhibit. Uncovering these letters raised important questions for us, such as how often did the transport of enslaved people on main ships happen? Based on the letters and the language used, it seems like a common ordeal. What do we have in our collection to tell this story? And how might this understanding impact our overall interpretation of Maine's maritime heritage? There are certain challenges inherent to researching and sharing this story. For one, hard evidence, such as the letters and the bill of lading associated with that specific journey pictured here, is hard to come by. We'll discuss why that is in more detail later on. In our collection, we have thousands of artifacts and documents that tell the story of how Maine's shipping and shipbuilding industry was successful, including plenty of evidence speaking to superior engineering, business acumen, and maritime skill. We have evidence showing how prominent members of coastal Maine communities leveraged global connections to accrue considerable wealth. We see this every day in the names of our counties, streets, libraries, in the quintessential New England captain's houses that crown hilltops and look out on main streets, in the elaborate tombs and monuments of our cemeteries. 
On this slide, we can see just a couple of quick examples of this. The name Pepperell, a notorious slave trader from Kittery. Bath's patent-free library and Maine Maritime Museum Sewell Hall, both named for prominent cotton shipping families. Likewise, we have a century and a half of historical narratives that reinforce the myth of a free North in the digestibly simple dichotomy of South versus North. Traditionally, New England's history has focused on the positive attributes of our heroes, the efforts of abolitionists who fought against slavery and the generosity of industry men who uplifted, uplifted these coastal communities. These stories, though sometimes embellished, are worthy of being told. There's a lot to be proud of in New England's history. However, historical figures and communities, much like the people and communities of today, were complicated, meaning an accurate understanding of the past depends on our acknowledging both the positive and negative attributes of our local histories. Having spent my entire education in New England schools, I too was admittedly partial to the notion that slavery was a Southern problem. The simplistic understanding of the past, however, is not only historically inaccurate, it's harmful. What do I mean by that? How does a simplistic interpretation of history have consequences in the present day? In other words, why does this stuff matter? This is the fundamental question we ask our students when teaching this subject. For without a reason, it's only natural for people, perhaps especially young people, to want to avoid thinking about a history that can be sensitive and pretty uncomfortable. We're going to arrive at an answer towards the end of my presentation, but I also look forward to hearing your thoughts in the Q&A or in the comments board so on what can hopefully be a conclusive conversation. Okay, let's turn to that question of why this history, Maine's involvement in the slave trade, is more challenging to research than say the history of shipbuilding. For one, historical, cultural, and academic institutions have largely failed to grow collections, conduct research, and share stories that reflect this facet of history. This is, fortunately, beginning to change. There are a number of reasons for this, many of which are plainly rooted in harmful traditions of Western historiography. Now, thankfully, institutions and historians are focusing efforts on better practices, believing that a more inclusive understanding of our past will help achieve a more equitable future. Another reason this history poses a challenge to research is that even when the transport of enslaved people was legal, some captains and shipping companies tried to conceal their involvement for political reasons. When it comes to the illegal transport of enslaved people across the Atlantic, which were the vastly more profitable journeys, it's pretty obvious why it's hard to find information. Records were either not kept or systematically destroyed for being incriminating evidence. Ship owners would strategically change the name of their ships to avoid being tracked in slave dealings leaving historians with the challenging role of piecing together scraps of records to uncover nefarious trading activity 150 years ago. And though challenging, a lot of people are doing this inspiring research, including the grassroots community-based historiography projects galvanized by Atlantic Black Box, which if you're not familiar, I strongly encourage you to check out. These efforts are succeeding to uncover existing documents like the ones we found in our collection that provide hard evidence to counter the myth of a free North and prove shared culpability in the American history of slavery. These obstacles though, naturally, present a challenge for curating an exhibit. If the documents are scarce and or non-existent, and if you're working with a collection that has never valued these stories in both collecting practices and cataloging, how are you to find material for an exhibit? The story of slavery in the US, however, pervades every facet of history. The strength of our collection at Maine Maritime Museum is in the heyday of Maine shipping and shipbuilding, which uncoincidentally coincides with the height of the slave trade. You can see here the thousands upon thousands of documents and objects our museum houses. The trick is in reinterpreting these artifacts to provide a more nuanced perspective on traditionally underrepresented historical narratives. It becomes a matter then of changing the lens through which we view our collection items. In the same way, this history can change the lens through which we view American history. Okay, 
Now into a quick timeline on the historical context of this subject. Beginning with the United States making the international import and export of enslaved people illegal in 1808, meaning that they considered it to be an act of piracy and therefore legally punishable by death. At this time, the Atlantic coast of Africa was patrolled by US and British government ships searching for slavers. Those that were caught were typically commandeered, the captives released in the colony of Liberia and the captain and crew punished. We're going to discuss, however, why this may not always have been the case, especially with American patrol vessels. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise marked the abolition of slavery in Northern states. This deal was pushed through in part by a now notorious politician named John C. Calhoun, who some historians claim to be a critical factor in the onset of the American Civil War. The deal admitted Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state, temporarily resolving the divisive issue of slavery. Please remember the name Calhoun later on in this presentation as it comes up again in a large way. In 1822, the American Colonization Society founded Liberia, a colony for emancipated enslaved people. This colony, now in its own nation, is where certain American and European ships would bring emancipated enslaved people. This too is going to be discussed in more detail later on. In 1850, the US enacted the Fugitive Slave Law, which required the return of self-emancipating enslaved people regardless of their location. This means a self-emancipating enslaved person, someone who escaped bondage in the South and made it to a free state such as Maine could and legally should have been turned into authorities. There are stories of this happening, of stowaways making it to Maine ports only to be harassed, captured and shipped back to slavery. At this time, Britain had already abolished slavery in all its colonies and was creating bilateral abolition treaties in a number of countries around the world. It's noteworthy, I think, that while Britain was abolishing slavery in its colonies, the US was simultaneously passing laws to strengthen the institution of slavery in Southern states. And then in 1862, Nathaniel Gordon, a captain from Portland, Maine, is the first person executed for involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. And finally, of course, after the Civil War, the US abolishes slavery in 1865. This ugly, tumultuous period of US history uncoincidentally coincides with an economic trade boom, heightened by a rapidly growing fleet of merchant sailing vessels. This marks the primary link to Maine. Okay, now diving into our collection items, which are going to guide me on a chr chronological conversation of this history. These objects, as I mentioned before, will serve as interpretive markers for us to view the history as rooted in primary source artifacts and documents. Beginning with the Sparhawk letters from 1754. These are a series of letters from Nathaniel Sparhawk, son-in-law to Sir William Pepperell, who is transporting enslaved people on his brig from Boston to a business friend in Biddeford. Sir William Pepperell was the most prominent slaveholder in Maine a merchant importing rum and enslaved people from a plantation in Antigua, which he very likely owned, to Maine. He owned 20 enslaved people at any given time and sent them throughout communities in Maine where families would often own one or two enslaved people to help with work. Pepperell's father, who amassed a fortune building ships in Maine, also owned enslaved people. These enslaving families profited off stolen labor, knowledge, and skills, a noteworthy fact that when traced through generations contributes to generational prestige and wealth. Having an enslaved person to take care of hard labor such as farming, building, cooking, etc., allowed these families to put their time into other money-making endeavors, freeing them from their homesteads required labor to pursue lucrative enterprises. Oftentimes their names live on in the names of towns, community centers, counties, roads, and markets. Examples referenced in these letters alone include the Waldo family, for whom Waldo County and Waldo Borough are named, and the Pepperells, for whom Pepperell Square and Pepperell Cove are named in Kittery. Many recognizable old names in this state 
can fairly easily be traced to prominent families who at one time in their lineage profited off the stolen labor of enslaved people. So these letters convey primarily a shipment from Boston where vessels from the West Indies would land. They include mention of, some, of rum, sugar, coffee, tea, and enslaved people, all cargo typically transported from the Caribbean to mainland North America at the time. They therefore represent Maine's impactful trade involvement with West Indies plantations and, along with ship logs and other letters, provide evidence of how the early Atlantic slave economy, sometimes referred to as the triangle trade system, entangled the Atlantic coasts. Northern New England merchants were in many ways just as involved, we're learning, as Southern and Caribbean plantation owners. A quick note on the early timber trade to the West Indies which directly implicates Maine in this triangle trade network. Prior to more research, more recent research, most notably that of late historian and scholar Eric Kimball, many historians were satisfied to explain Maine's timber exports as masts for British and colonial fleets. In fact, the vast majority of timber went to early slave plantations in the West Indies part of a larger trade system that enabled Maine merchants like Pepperell to profit off the shipment of sugar, rum, and enslaved people back to Maine, as we see in the Sparhawk letters. So Maine ships carrying lumber from Maine to the West Indies, plantations on the West Indies, and returning with slave produced goods and enslaved people themselves. This quote of, Quim of Kimball's shown here provides a tidy description for this region's economic connections to slavery. Although comparatively few slaves lived and worked in colonial New England, slavery was essential to the economic growth of all four colonies in the region. This sentiment holds true for Maine's economy all the way through to the Civil War, when Mainers were profiting off the cotton trade, which is what we're going to discuss in greater detail in the second half of this lecture. All right, 40 years after the Sparhawk letters, we find in our collection a logbook from the Bath schooner Siren of the Kennebec from its June 1795 voyage from Kingston, Jamaica to Savannah, Georgia. On this voyage, the vessel is transporting 70 enslaved captives, French passengers, and likely illegal rum. On this voyage, the captain earned $1,000 off the transport of enslaved people, and due to disease outbreak while underway, several people died in transit including captive children and at least one crew member. This log is special in that it provides a rare glimpse into the slapdash mom and pop type operations of small private shipping fleets in early America, making it an extra exciting logbook to read. Much of our logs are from later and larger vessels and their meticulously detailed recordings speak to the structured, refined business accounts of the shipping and insurance companies invested in their voyages. Not so for the siren log, which conveys a completely different kind of voyage. Basically, everything that could go wrong does. Disease outbreak on board, they're forced to quarantine, they have legal trouble with the delivery of rum, they're forced to flee back to Bath because of that illegal delivery of rum, and once back in Bath, they enter another string of embarrassing mishaps, collecting and transporting timber through Merry Meeting Bay, where they repeatedly run aground, capsize, and lose their cargo. The vessel actually endures a really shocking string of events, and the log, written candidly, exhibits countless instances of racism against Black wharf workers and mariners in Caribbean ports. The point is that it was not rare for ships traveling from Maine to the Caribbean to return with a shipment of cargo that included human captives. Maine captains made this journey regularly and were, as is evident here, willing to transport whatever would be the most lucrative for them and their company. Indeed, the Caribbean islands were a major stopping point for transatlantic slave ships crossing back from Africa. It was by many counts easier to sell the captives to plantation owners in the West Indies, many of whom calculated that a constant influx of new enslaved labor was more profitable than feeding their existing labor force, making the life expectancy for an enslaved person on a Caribbean sugar plantation, for example, a horrifying seven years. Moving forward, 
Remember that Congress banned the international slave trade in 1808 and in 1820 had declared it to be an act of piracy, making the crime punishable by death. Recent research supports that despite the ban, main ships continued to cross the Atlantic to transport enslaved people from Africa to the Americas. At this time, British and American ships did patrol the waters off the west coast of Africa, but the potential for profits made it well worth the risk for main captains. Pictured here is an example of one such slave ship evading a British patroller. It's painted by Maine artist and sailor Frank Stanwood in 1878. The fact that a Maine artist was inspired, presumably by firsthand accounts, to paint this scene is telling of Maine mariners' involvement in these illegal yet highly profitable voyages. The risk for captain and crew was especially worth it because though British patrollers would prosecute, sometimes by burning ships and imprisoning crew, the US Congress would always let the captains off easy, sometimes allowing the same ships to continue sailing after dropping off the captives in Liberia. Intentionally lax law enforcement, therefore reduced risk and meant that these journeys would continue to happen, a clear indication that politicians at the time chose not to risk economic harm by strictly reducing the amount of stolen labor employed on Southern plantations. In other words, they did little to empower this law. As I mentioned, a major reason information on these illegal voyages is tough to find is because slave traders were savvy. They would change the name of their vessel, destroy evidence, and sell captives in places like Cuba, where it would be tougher to track their dealings. Again, strong research is happening to uncover these stories, and you can learn about them at Atlantic Black Boxes blog. Our collection is correspondingly sparse in this avenue at Maine Maritime Museum, at least as far as our records currently indicate. But we do have this print of the Maine Clipper Nightingale depicted in 1854 when it stopped in New York City. Built in 1851 in Elliott, it was used as a tea clipper and very soon after, an illegal transatlantic slave ship until it was captured by US patrol ships in 1861 off the coast of Africa, sold to the US Navy and used during the Civil War as a supply ship and a coal ship supporting a naval blockade. After the war, it goes on to have an even more interesting life. The Navy sold the ship and it goes on to have a career as an Arctic explorer and merchant vessel in the North Atlantic, where it finally sinks in 1893. Slave ships like the Nightingale would often develop reputations for their work and would carry a stigma with them when they arrived at Northern ports. Despite reputations, these ships could go on to have profitable careers making regular transatlantic slave trade voyages. As I mentioned, the only time in US history that someone was executed for engagement in the international slave trade was in 1862, not surprisingly during Abraham Lincoln's presidency. The man was Nathaniel Gordon, a Maine ship captain from Portland who loaded 897 African captives, mostly children, into his ship, the Erie, in West Africa. Gordon is quoted as saying he preferred to deal and kidnap children because they were less likely to rise up against him evidence of the gruesome logic these slave traders employed for their business dealings. The ship was captured by a US patroller in 1861 and Gordon was convicted. Unlike prior presidents who were lax on slavers, Lincoln went through with the full prosecution. Gordon's supporters petitioned Lincoln to call a pardon, but Lincoln refused even to meet with them, which was very uncharacteristic of him as he was traditionally averse to the death penalty. Lincoln is quoted as saying, in the name of justice and the majesty of the law, there ought to be one case, at least one specific instance of a professional slave trader, a Northern white man given the exact penalty of death because of the incalculable deaths he and his kind inflicted upon black men amid the horror of the sea voyage from Africa. Thus in one motion, Lincoln makes a symbol of Gordon and sends a warning to Northern Mariners that the times are changing. 
It is worth mentioning here that the US had 11 presidents between the declaration of the slave trade as an act of piracy and the first full prosecution 41 years later, a rather disturbing fact that reveals how ineffective the law has been against hindering acts of racism. During this period between 1820 and 1865, the domestic slave trade was not only legal, but celebrated by politicians and business owners alike as essential for the burgeoning US economy. The shipment of raw materials from the Southern US and Caribbean to manufacturing hubs in New England and especially Europe enabled immense growth in the shipping industry. Maine, already poised with the vast traditions, skills and resources for shipping and shipbuilding, was then well suited to capitalize on these trades, which by the 1820s was focusing more and more on one single cash crop, cotton. And that leads us into the heart of the exhibit and the heart of this talk. In short, main ships were providing a global market for products produced by enslaved people, increasing the reach of cotton, which in turn increased the global demand for the crop especially as innovations in textile manufacturing rapidly improved. An increase in demand of cotton, of course, meant an increase in the labor force on Southern cotton plantations, meaning more enslaved people coming to the Southern United States. It's hard to overstate how important the cotton trade was to Maine shipping. Maine mariners took pride in the trade collecting souvenirs like this stereoscopic image from our collection, which celebrates the sheer amount of cotton coming out of the South for shipment. The cotton trade created jobs, innovations in engineering and wealth for shipyards throughout Maine. There's no denying the fact that producing bigger and bigger and more and more ships steadily increased the global demand for cotton, prompting Southern plantations to seek larger labor forces. And it's no coincidence that New Orleans was the largest cotton port in the world, as well as the largest market for buying and selling enslaved people. The ship logs in our collection speak to the constant frequency with which Maine ships visited New Orleans, many of them simply going back and forth from New Orleans to Liverpool with cargoes of cotton. Liverpool, as you may know, was a hub of textile manufacturing at the time. At the onset of the cotton boom, two bath shipping dynasties came into their own, the Pattons and the Sewells. Their budding shipyards and others caused such an, such an increase in the population that Bath officially outgrew its designation as a town and became a city. This panoramic oil painting from 1844 shows the extremely active shipyards and riverfront of Bath. The cotton trade enabled this activity. We're going to start with the Pattons of Bath, who by the mid 1850s were said to control the nation's largest fleet of private merchant vessels. Stemming from a long lineage of main shipping, John and George F. Patton made small fortunes shipping lumber to the West Indies and molasses, sugar, and rum back to Maine. We already know from the Sparhawk letters and the Siren logbook that these are, of course, slave produced products, very typical to early Maine shipping routes. It wasn't until the Pattons ventured into the budding cotton trade, however, that they started amassing tons of wealth. The two brothers, John and George F., are considered to be instrumental in the development of the city of Bath. They helped the community by supporting the children's home, the home for old ladies, and by serving in city government. They founded the Patton Library Association, which charged admission or membership at the time, but when in 1887, another philanthropist donated enough funds for it to be free to the public, adopted its current name, the Patton Free Library in downtown Bath. The Pattons also stocked libraries on some of their ships to encourage crews to educate themselves. At this time, wealth and prestige meant power. In other words, the Pattons had a lot of influence and ostensibly used it for good. Beneath the surface though, there's a lot more going on. George, the younger of the brothers, was treasurer of the American Colonization Society, 
a group who you'll remember from before, believed in shipping emancipated enslaved people to the colony they founded in Africa, which they kind of uncreatively called Liberia. Between 1822 and the Civil War, 15,000 free African Americans went to Liberia, most of them by choice. However, by the 1850s, when George F. Patton was treasurer and actively seeking to raise funds to build a main ship for the society, some historians are now claiming that the colonization society had basically started forcibly emancipating free people to Africa without consent. By this time, trips to Africa were more heavily scrutinized by the law in an attempt to prevent the transatlantic slave trade. So voyages marked under the guise of the ACS may have provided a good legal excuse for slavers to go to West Africa. And on their return journey, there's now reason to believe that these same ships brought enslaved people back to the Americas. In other words, research is beginning to suggest that the American Colonization Society towards the end of its existence may have forcibly emancipated people to Africa on ships that were only used to then procure a new shipment of enslaved captives from the continent back to the Americas. These cotton shipping families, largest of which were the Pattons, had a lot of wealth and therefore influence on the coast of Maine. Their political views oftentimes strategically mimicked their business partners at Southern cotton ports and plantations, and they advocated, oftentimes successfully, for policy that would not interfere with their relationships with Southern plantation owners. The cotton trade then gives Maine coastal communities prominent influential figures striving to protect their business interests by advocating for laws and politicians that will protect the institution of slavery. This obviously created a complicated political divide in a region also considered to be a terminus for the Underground Railroad. John Todd, a Bath resident, barber, and writer for the Portland Press Herald, provides insight into how shipping interests swayed opinions on abolition. As a barber, he had his finger on the pulse of the varied public opinions in the region and is able to speak to these conflicting ideologies in Bath and other coastal Maine communities. According to Todd, when Frederick Douglass, the formerly enslaved man who became a prominent activist, writer, and orator, sought a place to speak in Bath, he was met with opposition because residents feared what abolition would do to the shipping industry and their relationships with cotton plantation owners and wharf workers in the South, and in turn, Maine's economy. Todd writes in his autobiography, there were but few abolitionists in Bath at the time. It was a great ship owning place and they did not wish to offend the cotton growers of the South for the Bath ships were carrying cotton raised by slaves from the Southern ports to Liverpool, England. And it might interfere with those ships getting freight if the abolitionists held meetings to agitate the question of slavery. No haul could be had for Douglas. After a hard fight, Mr. Gilman, with the help of two or three of the wealthiest members of his church, secured the vestry of his church. They being ship owners, it was a great surprise to most of the people that they did not consult their pockets at all in deciding a moral question. This quote, I think, speaks well to the converging ideologies of the place and time. Moral abolitionism versus economic anti-abolitionism. All right, we discussed the patents. Now on to the other prominent cotton shipping family from this time in Bath, the Sewells. William Dunning Sewell from Bath partnered with Freeman Clark, a store owner in Bath, to start a small shipyard. At first, all their timber came from the Sewell's land and the shipyard workers were paid with store credit from Clark's store. This was particularly advantageous for Clark and Sewell given that they couldn't resist marking prices up, a custom that forced workers into debt and tied them to their businesses. Neither Clark nor Sewell had any prior experience with shipbuilding, but living in Bath and being born into resources, they kind of absorbed the knowledge of the industry. Clearly, these guys were savvy businessmen. 
In fact, their company and its successors pioneered hull designs specifically to increase the amount of cotton able to be transported per voyage. The Rappahannock, built in 1841 and shown here, is the first ever ship equipped with one of these patented cotton hull designs, specifically engineered to carry as much cotton as possible. I'll note too that the naming of Sewell vessels is pretty interesting. Rappahannock, Roanoke, Shenandoah, the list of Southern places and people goes on. A clear tribute to the Sewell's reliance on and commitment to their business relationships with Southern plantations and ports. The same ship naming tactics were also employed by Camden Yards relevant to this speech. One such example, the brigantine Taco, was built in Camden in 1854 and is named for a city in Northeast Georgia. It was captured by the Spanish in 1861 after already disembarking 627 enslaved people at an unspecified port in Cuba. 130 enslaved people perished on that single journey from the Congo River to Cuba. Right now, we're not sure how many slave voyages the Taco made, but there's reason to believe it wasn't captured on its first trip. It has never been any secret that main shipbuilding towns accrued considerable wealth through the cotton trade. However, the fact that this wealth stems from the stolen labor of enslaved people has, it seems, been brushed aside. Because slavery happened thousands of miles away and the general population up here did not witness the horrors, it was evidently easy for people to treat the issue as out of sight, out of mind. This is not excusable but we would be lying to ourselves if we said we did not understand. There are innumerable comforts we consume daily that bring harm to distant communities and our planet, yet oftentimes we don't think twice. I know at least that I am guilty of this. As I've stated, recent research has now brought to light that in addition to profiting off cotton, main ships also transported enslaved captives themselves in the middle of the 19th century when slavery was illegal in Maine. This was, we're realizing, not at all uncommon. In fact, according to recent research by Dr. Kate McMahon from the Center of the Study of Global Slavery, in the 1850s and 60s, Maine's slave ship fleet was nearly four times as profitable as its timber industry. This includes not only the illegal transatlantic, but the legal domestic trade as well. Which brings us to the Lowell letters. The series of documents we uncovered in the Sewell Fleet business records we house in our archives. These records are thousands and thousands of pages long, so we have different aisles filled with boxes of letters and business dealings, receipts, pages, ship plans. Pretty interesting, but a little bit daunting to do research in there. But it goes to show how much more is out there to be uncovered. In 1850, Captain John C. Lowell was writing in Baltimore on the Sewell ship. John C. Calhoun, built in Bath in 1847, searching for enough cargo to make freight or ensure a profitable journey to New Orleans. You'll remember the name John C. Calhoun, the Southern statesman who signed the Missouri Compromise. He was a staunch anti-abolitionist who, some historians say, should be considered the man who started the Civil War. Calhoun, who held political office as high as vice president to John Quincy Adams, believed adamantly that slavery was necessary to the success of the nation. The fact that Clark and Sewell Co. named a ship in tribute to him is a clear acknowledgement that they also wanted to protect the institution of slavery in order to protect their business dealings. Captain Lowell, a Bath native, is struggling to find freight, recognizing that each day that passes, he is losing money for the company. He is anxiously writing to Clark and Sewell, informing them of the glut of ships in Baltimore and the lack of cargo. A boatload of pipes sunk, Lowell writes. I am in hopes they will raise the boat so that we shall get the pipe. His frustration in these letters is palpable. He cannot find enough cargo. Then he mentions that he is in talks with a slave dealer for 80 enslaved people at $12 per head. I think the prospect good for 40 or 50 more at the same rate, he says. Please say nothing of my taking them. The domestic trade is legal at this point, but after three decades of abolition in Maine, 
Lowell is showing here that he recognizes the social implications of transporting enslaved people on a main vessel. Again, what happens far away from home, out of sight, is tolerable, but he does not want his own community to know what he's doing. Lowell, by the way, died mysteriously years later by what is suspected to be a suicide. He got up from dinner with his family one night in February and left without a word. The next day, his body was found eddying downriver in the Kennebec. Moral strain from his tasks captaining a vessel in southern waters? Maybe, of course we can't know, but the moral strain of the business dealings seems to have been real. The only response to Lowell we have in this series of letters has been water damaged beyond legibility. But we can tell from the dates that the Sewells responded immediately with their support of Lowell's proceedings. With a vessel named after John C. Calhoun, this should come as no surprise. Within Lowell's letters, he indicates a handwritten account list of his cargo. And in small scribbled letters at the very end of the multi-page list is written 93 slaves. UMaine's Library Special Collections houses the official bill of lading from this voyage, and they loaned it to us for the exhibit. It is, in my opinion, the most disturbing document on display. I'd like to take a moment and read the names, and encourage you to read the names, ages, and prices of the enslaved people listed here, each with a life, family, and community ravaged by American greed. Number three, John Riley. 19 years old, $710. Number seven, Emmanuel Rideout, 28 years old, $843. Number 76, Amelia Cole, 17 years old, $700. Number 90, Mary Butler, 14 years old, $470. This voyage, which was perfectly legal, was common. The reason it has escaped our narrative of history is simple. It's unpleasant. It is now well past the time that we examine these stories because their unpleasantness makes them all the more critical to acknowledge. As we know, everything changed with the Civil War. The cotton trade obviously suffered dramatically. Main shipping and wooden shipbuilding, though there would be later resurgences, was never the same. In the war ravaged 1860s, business tanked for Maine cotton fleets. At this point, I want to hone in on a quote from Jarvis Patton, a younger second cousin to the cotton boom Patton brothers who took an optimistic look at the business disaster of the 1860s. Although at first looked upon as a death blow to our commerce, the result was that our ships sought employment in other occupations instead of depending almost entirely upon the cotton trade. There is a lesson here in young Jarvis Patton's optimism for resilience. Politicians like Calhoun and influential businessmen like Clark and Sewell fought to protect slavery because it protected their own financial interests. And until Lincoln, they had the majority of politically influential figures convinced that slavery was essential to upholding the American economy. Yet when we take a closer look at the laborers in this economy, we see that while slavery indisputably fueled wealth for upper-class plantation owners, mill owners, shipyard owners, captains, and politicians, the labor force endured harmful conditions and grueling lives. Slavery fueled textile mills. We know the working conditions there families forced into labor in order to pay rent in their mill-owned tenements. The crews of cotton ships likewise were not paid well and it was exceedingly dangerous work. Even building ships was dangerous and as we learned in the business ideals of Clark and Sewell was poorly paid, in their case, paid in store credit to Clark's own store, working their own workers into debt. During slave times then, the US economy was primarily benefiting the upper crust, those with the means to profit. Jarvis Patton's point that business could thrive despite slavery is an important testament to the greater potential for an economy rooted in equitable practice, something we're still striving towards today. We've just discussed how the celebrated maritime history of Maine profited off and contributed to slavery and how major players in the industry sympathized with the Confederate cause 
and advocated against abolition. All that said, we know there is always dissent against the institution of slavery. The point here is not that Mainers and main businesses were evil, but that history, much like our present times, is not cut and dry. It's a tangled mess of contrasting political and ideological beliefs, and more often than not, those in power get to determine the legacy that's passed on. We cannot change what happened in the past, but we can change the way we interpret the past by challenging simplistic, celebratory narratives and emphasizing perspectives that have for so long gone unacknowledged. We can achieve greater equity in historiography by including more stories, introducing new heroes and refuting the mantra that victors write history. Indeed, a more inclusive understanding of the past not only represents more honest historiography, it hopefully in some ways might help achieve a national identity rooted in equity. This is to say, the way we remember the past determines how we create our future. I'm concluding on this slide because it's indicative of something we see all the time in New England. On the left is the well-manicured tombstone of a man made famous by wealth accrued in the cotton trade. On the right, from the same era, is the gravestone of Francis Houston, a Black man born into slavery who went on to secure his freedom and serve as an experienced mariner, naval veteran, farmer, and critical player in Brunswick and Bath's Underground Railroad. As a leader of the Plains community, which was the state's second largest African-American community after Portland at the time, and it was located right between Brunswick and Bath, Houston helped countless Black Americans make homes here in Maine. Both Sewell and Houston were prominent members of their communities, celebrated in their lifetimes for their generosity, work ethic, and skills. One profited off the stolen labor of enslaved people, while the other helped enslaved people seek freedom. One's home is celebrated with a plaque still to this day, while the other's entire community, the Plains community, much like the 93 individuals unwillingly transported on the Sewell ship in 1850, has all but been erased from this region's and our country's history. The vast parking lots of Cook's Corner Shopping Mall, now Market's Place. This is to say, we need to view the history of American slavery not as something that ended with the passing of the 13th Amendment and not with the unwittingly racist lens through which our predecessors have chosen to focus historical narratives, but with what we're able to do now to more accurately remember the past and honor more historical figures, not just the ones who left behind a visible legacy of prosperity and success. Because after all, a future rooted in justice and equality depends on our accurate understanding of the past. And that's where I'll conclude my talk. Thank you for listening. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions and ideas in the chat. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. Um, I invite our audience at this time to please go ahead. If you have any questions for Luke to go ahead and type them into the Q&A box and I will read them aloud to him. Um, thank you. What a valuable and eye-opening um, talk that was. I, I think that we're all very aware of the, as you mentioned at the top of the program, um, you know, we're, we're taught that the uh, sentiment across the North was anti-slavery and you just did a magnificent job helping us to see the perspective of how very complex it truly was um, and so much of it because of industry. And um, I just couldn't help but continue to think as you were talking, um, how relevant that is to today and how we um, we rarely consider where uh, so many of the goods that we purchase are from and the conditions in which they are made in China and such other places. So, um, so important to reflect on that past uh, and consider how we are still experiencing so much of this today. Um, let me just go ahead and jump into the Q&A because I see a lot of questions coming in. Um, so Jan says, uh, could you address the 13th Amendment, which does not in fact outlaw slavery, an exception is made for anyone who is incarcerated, leading to a second round of slavery and continues to allow residents of carceral facilities to endure forced labor without pay. Yeah, that's a great point. I am admittedly not an expert. Um, so Jan, Jan, is it? Jan, you, yes. you likely know more than I do based on that question. Um, I did watch the documentary 13th, which spoke a lot to that 
And I think that was a really powerful way of bring introducing this history in a really accessible way to people. Mm -hmm. And like Julia said, to introduce this Q&A section, kind of advancing it into how this is very hyper relevant in the world today and how we need to open our eyes and be more aware of things that are happening. The 13th Amendment, along with many of these laws passed throughout American history, including that law in 1808 that made the transatlantic slave trade an act of piracy, are clearly either not being held up or have loopholes in them. Um, I think that you're really smart to point out the 13th Amendment as one of those laws, which is why I say that this history does not conclude with the ending of the Civil War. There's still to this day a lot to be uncovered and a lot to be resolved. So I'm sorry, I know that's not a super academic response to your question, but it's the best I can do for now. Thank no, you. That's a very good point. Thank you. Um, so I want to get into some questions that are coming in about the research that you did for this. Uh, Angela wants to know if you encountered any resistance to doing this research in Maine. Um, she says it feels like it runs against the self-concept of many proud Mainers, as you mentioned at the start of the presentation. Yeah, thank you. People always ask that. And I have not, actually. Um, people ask whether the descendants of these families, they're still around, they're prominent names in these communities today, as I pointed out, whether they come in or send us emails and are unhappy about it. It's actually quite the opposite that I've found. People are really ready to hear a new perspective on history and to hear these, learn these new stories. Um, I think after George Floyd is a time when a lot of people's eyes have been opened, including my own, and um, people are excited for the most part to learn them. We, the places that we have had pushback have been on social media, maybe not surprisingly. So keyboard warriors and the comfort of their homes who are much more ready to attack us for the work and the research that we're doing. Um, we, in the exhibit at the museum, we have, I wanted it to engage the community, so I wanted to have visitor feedback readily available and on display. I installed a um, clothesline where people can pin up comments about what they feel, their responses, other ideas, other avenues of research, stories that connect. Uh, we expected to have to monitor this really closely, fearing some of the things that we've seen on social media, which is outright racism. Mm. In fact, every single person has been nothing but constructive and celebrating this, or I mean, acknowledging the importance of this history. So actually we have had very little real pushback. I kind of take those things on social media to be just fluff. I don't know if people just angry at home on their computers, but mm -hmm. it's a great question. Thank you. And I, I just my own personal question related to what you just said, um, how have the responses from the teachers been uh, for the presentations you've been doing for schools? Yeah, yeah, they've been strong. So since we opened this exhibit, we have been offering free field trips to any students, any teachers who want to bring their students in to see the material. I think it's an element that has obviously been lacking from traditional high school and middle school history classes. And so there's not too much content to teach it right now. Um, me and the other educators at Maine Maritime Museum are developing curriculum to help teachers. That's marvelous. So we provide some lesson plans in advance. They're also available on our website and students can work through those and they come in with some background context and they see the exhibit. Teachers have been very much enjoying that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I teachers don't have a ton of time, I understand, as someone who used to be a teacher. So it's nice to be able to do this research and support them in providing this history. Students themselves are also so ready to talk about this. I think the youngest age we have are 12 year olds in sixth mm. grade. And we always check in with them, you know, preface it that it's a sensitive topic, it can be challenging. For the most part, I think we've only had two students who kind of get too uncomfortable to talk about it. But mm. The connections that Julia made at the end of my talk about how this is relevant in the present day, students without prompting always go there. They want to take it to something that's relevant and meaningful, and this history is. So it's a way to actually really connect with young people and make learning exciting and fun and new. 
Well, thank you so much for inspiring them to think that way and, and encouraging the teachers with the resources you're providing. Um, we're having just a bazillion uh, comments and questions come in. We have a very large audience, over 100 people still here tonight. Um, I'm going to get to as many as I can. Uh, so John wants to say that this is one of the best lectures that he has attended on this subject over the past decade. Uh, thank you for it. And please continue to present to additional audiences. So I just want to make sure we got that complimented. Wow, thank you very much, John. And John that comes to a lot of talks. So he's a it's a big, it's a big compliment. Um, okay, so uh, Angela also wanted to know um, if in your research that you found any information, um, I don't know, logs, things like that from uh, sailors or other members of the crew who are perhaps lower in rank um, with any perspectives reflecting what they thought of um, the uh, black captives that they were transporting. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's one of the challenges too, right? It, it goes right along with this history that what we have is mostly histories written, records kept by captains and business owners. So we're still, we're getting kind of the upper crust's take on history. Unfortunately, those are the resources that are most readily available and easy to find because they were the most learned in reading and writing and had the resources to keep these notes. Mm. I would love to find more on ordinary sailors' opinions on this. Um, I think that the Siren logbook is one way that we can get really close because that wasn't a very wealthy operation. Everyone on board, or I mean, the writing seems to convey pretty racist tendencies mm -hmm. for all on board. It seems like in the 1700s, that was just the culture pervasive throughout the United States. Um, oh, I just had a thought and it left my mind. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we can move on. I have a whole bunch of questions to ask. Uh, someone would like to know if there were any other prosecutions in relation to the slave trade in the US or was the one that you mentioned the only one? As far as I know, and I could be wrong, so this is worth doing a little quick search on. I think it was the only one. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really, as Lincoln's quote suggests, a symbolic move. He has become president. This is something that's important to him, obviously. And it's kind of sending the signal throughout the country. And then obviously, a couple of years later, the Civil War starts. So the, the point is moot. But it is kind of astonishing that it began the law was passed in 1808 and 1861 is when the first person is convicted to the full extent of the law. There were other convictions, but this is the first hanging. And I believe I'm pretty confident that it was the only one. Mm. Um, we have oh, a few I'm sorry. Oh, I did ahead. remember the instance. I wanted to okay, answer the yeah. previous question. We have this manuscript in our collection that I didn't talk about in this lecture, but it is an ordinary mariner and shipbuilder from Bath, who goes on a lumbering voyage with a, his shipbuilding crew or a couple members he sent down to Virginia. And he is a Republican, which if you know history at the time means that he is supporting Lincoln, he is against slavery. And he spends, he takes a lot of notes traveling through Virginia, spends a lot of times in the woods mm. doing logging and meets a lot of enslaved people and interviews them. He's really mm. interested in learning about them. And he is not racist at all. He's a, seems like a, a really good person. His, someone on his lumbering expedition catches wind of him being a Republican. This is kind of, things are heating up with the Civil War and they spread the word throughout. So it's all he can do. His boss ends up tipping him off that he needs to flee Virginia. It's all he can do to get a ride to the port where he's immediately put on a ship and brought back to Maine before basically a mob was after him. Wow. So they heard that he was trying to help enslaved people and legally, I mean, that was illegal at the time, so. Yeah, but what a, what a valuable document to have, to have again, as you mentioned, some different perspectives on how people felt. Um, we, we have a few folks who are asking similar questions, so I'm gonna just uh, bunch these together. Um, so there are people whose ancestors were master mariners, sailors, shipbuilders, um, and they want to know how they could find out if their family members were involved in this trade. Can you recommend any resources? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Atlantic Black Box. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with their blog, it has a ton of information and a lot of links to really good sites that are popping up to help with this sort of thing. I think that the best way to go about this though would be ancestry.com and learning more about mm -hmm. who they were connected with, what vessels they were on, whether they're building vessels or working on vessels. If you can get that vessel name, mm -hmm. then you can go to slavevoyages.org, which is a great site. It has database of hundreds and thousands of voyages. That's actually how I found the, the Camden ship that I presented on. Mm -hmm. um, you can plug in the name of the vessel. You can even plug in the town that they were from maybe plug in their name that might hit some results if they were prominent builders or captains. And you will find out if those vessels that they were on, if there's any currently recorded slave voyages. So obviously, as I talked a lot about, it's limited, right? Vessels made that journey to Africa illegally a lot of times and they never got caught. So it happened a lot. It takes a lot of deep research to figure out whether certain ships that you might be wondering about actually did transport enslaved people. So I've heard researchers talk about how they had to trace a ship that claimed that they was traveling with gold to some place and then that the port never actually saw the gold, but it was a way that they could convey the amount of money that they had made off of a voyage or something, but it's all just lies. So it's, it's tricky. I haven't gotten into that deep of research, but I definitely encourage you to do so. And feel free to come to Maine Maritime Museum's library archives where you have tens of thousands of documents and you might find information on your family there. And again, I, you have listed off many resources and many great suggestions. And I'm just going to let folks know, I will email you all the link to the recording tonight. So we're posting it on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel, but I want to make it really easy for you to go back and review this because many questions are coming in about, uh, you know, topics that you addressed earlier that I think you'll just be able to rewind the the video and watch it. So uh, I'm going to try to get to some of the questions that um, aren't necessarily related to something that you've already discussed. Um, so uh, this person is asking, how can one find information about the Colonization Society? Yeah, the Colonization Society kept really good records. They did, I think, quarterly, maybe annually. They have newsletters. Um, they're actually, a bunch of them are on Google Books. So you can just Google oh, really? Colonization Society and Google will pull up pages for you. So mm. you can find the information that I presented about George F. Patton as treasurer in there. They did a whole spread in one of their newsletters after he died, um, kind of remembering him and all that he accomplished for the ACS. So that one is pretty easy to research and um, I would start just Googling it. Mm. Uh, Dana says, I have, uh, I have, I always have trouble grasping exactly what historiography is, but I understand it. It has to do with the writing and reporting of history. In light of recent attempts in many US states to suppress the sharing of historical perspectives much milder, even than I was than what was presented here, I, oops, and then it got cut off. Okay, I apologize, Dana, that seemed to have gotten cut off. Um, John wants to know, have you contacted the New Hampshire Black History Trail people led by Jerry and Bogus in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire? Also the brand new International Black History Museum in, oh, the brand new International Black History Museum in Charleston, South Carolina has just opened or is about to open. Did you communicate with either of those organizations? I did not communicate, but my parents live right near Portsmouth and mm. my dad and I walked on the trail and it's really really awesome that they did that in Portsmouth very very cool thing to do and that is news to me about the new museum opening so thank you very much for sharing that I am looking forward to looking into that um someone is asking I'm curious to know why the list of slaves all have English first and last names are the names acquired in the West Indies I expected more traditional African names yeah, that's a great point. So this voyage in 1851, these are enslaved people who are likely born on American plantations, right? So this is a legal voyage. It was domestic. Anyone coming over from Africa would be very illegal at the time and likely would have had their name changed upon reaching the US. Um, so the last names are probably the last names of plantation owners is often how it went to kind of claim ownership and they are given 
English or American names, sometimes by the plantation owners also. Mm. So likely all of those enslaved people were born in the US. Thank you. Um, so Michael is saying, James Bowden made a lot of profit transporting the lowest grade codfish to feed slaves in the West Indian plantations. Are there other main products besides lumber that have been identified as tied directly to the slave trade? Well, oh, resources from Maine. Yeah, so the, I, the codfish yeah. were used to feed slaves in, in the West Indies. Are there any other resources that were being shipped out of Maine um, that were directly tied to the slave trade? Not that I know of, but mm -hmm. likely there were. I think that's worth doing more research on. Um, and I didn't know that about James Bowden and the codfish. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that, very interesting. Um, James wants to know, can you recommend any sources which would provide further information on the emancipated slave community that existed for a time between Bath and Brunswick? Was it called Plains Community? Yeah, the Plains Community. There's very little information about it, but people are doing really good research on it. And I can share maybe with Julia after this, something that she can send out. There's a book titled Maine's Visible Black History. And the authors and researchers of that book have done a fantastic job digging through the, I know they used a lot of gravesite research. That's where I got the picture of Francis Houston's grave and um, found a lot of cool maps where we're able to mark up maps. So there is good kind of grassroots research happening on the Plains community. And it's amazing that there aren't more records about it. It's, it's largely wiped away from memory, as I mentioned, but Yes, there is research happening, and I would start with that book. And Barb Desmaris, I believe, is one of the contributing writers. And I met with her, and she provided all this amazing information. So I will send Julia some her name, and maybe maybe she would be willing to work on it. Yes, that. and any resources you want to send, I'll include in that in that email. Um, to uh, that includes the link to this program. Um, I, and again, you just mentioned the, the grave sites and, and um, could you repeat where the grave sites were located where Houston's grave is? Yeah, Houston's grave is in Brunswick, I believe, I, I think Pine, Pine Street Cemetery. Though I, I could be wrong, I can, I can check in on that and let you know. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Sewell grave is in Oak Grove Cemetery right in Bath. Oh, good memory there. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's right near where I live. <laughs> okay. Um, here we go. Uh, do you have any tips for people in Maine interested in investigating the hidden histories related to the slave trade with their own towns? Yeah. Yeah, I would start with Ancestry.com. I would okay. go to your historical society. A lot of towns have really awesome historical societies mm -hmm. and libraries. And chances are people have done good research in the past and mm. it's on record. So for instance, at Maine Maritime Museum, we have an amazing team of volunteers and transcribers who have gone through all these documents years ago for decades and have notes on them. It's just a matter of the perspective with which people have been reading them. So they're not necessarily searching to flag things directly related to slavery. And that's likely the case at some of these historical societies and libraries where people have done the research, they're just looking for different things, but you're gonna be able to access their research. And if things are uploaded into a database that's searchable, hopefully your search terms in your specific towns will start coming up with results. Otherwise, I would say just keep digging through. Historical societies are a really good place to start. And the farther back you go, you're pretty much guaranteed to find some, some mm -hmm. things connected to slavery. Uh, Laura wants to know, were sea captains shipping molasses to Maine in the mid 19th century necessarily involved in the slave trade? So was every was everything going on um, with trips to the West Indies necessarily considered involved in the slave trade? Yeah, that's another great question. The answer is no, not necessarily. I would I like to imagine that some of these captains had strong morals. I think there's there's no doubt that that wouldn't be the case, right? That they there are captains and crews and ships who just simply refused to do whatever it took to make freight. I think that in 1851, Lowell is already exhibiting this kind of like moral tension, right? Reading through those letters, you can really get a sense that he might not be totally comfortable with it. 
And I, I like to think that's probably true for captains who had even stronger morals than Lowell and shipping companies. Probably there are some that straight up prohibited it, especially because in the mid 19th century, which your question was based on, it's slavery is illegal in Maine and there's already this big stigma around it. So yeah, it's a good question. And I would say no, that there is shipment that's just clean, right? The fact of the matter is though, is that that molasses likely came from sugar plantations in the West Indies that is entirely employed by enslaved people. And those are the worst living conditions, I believe of any, any plantation. So. Mm. Um, June and Roy had an interesting um, question. They want to know what is being done to share this uh, information with African-Americans with apologies from involved families, political leaders, cities named after traders of enslaved people uh, and related industries. Is any of the research you've done being, or, or that is going on being shared with the African-American community? Probably in some ways. Um... I have not done a good job of that. This also isn't totally my research. I'm just synthesizing other researchers. Um, I do not know for sure, but I know that it's a great idea and it should be happening. With this exhibit and this research, we partnered with an Africana Studies course at Bowdoin to make sure that we could contextualize it in more of like a national global narrative. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to bring a global con perspective into this kind of local history. Um, but I agree that there's a lot more that could happen. And yeah, that's, it's a really great point. So thank you for making that. Yes, and I finally caught up with uh, the other part of Dana's comment. Um, and she, you know, she's feeling troubled that stories like this could be silenced in some places and to so many of our fellow Americans. And she just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's it's really disturbing that that's the case, and it's uh, it's shocking that we live in a democracy in which information is being legally stifled in large parts of our country. Um, I think that the more we are hearing about some of these laws in some parts of the country, the more shocked I am. Mm -hmm. I gave a lecture similar to this yesterday, and there were some viewers zooming in from Florida, and they told me that I wouldn't have been allowed to present on this in Florida right now. Wow, that was yeah. kind of interesting to hear and really sad. I'm, I like to believe, though, that there are teachers throughout the country who are breaking that rule. At least I hope there are. Um, I think it's really important that young people are at least exposed to a real history, the actual truth of this country. Otherwise it's, yeah, I think we're at least the person who asked the question seems to be in agreement that that's not a healthy thing for democracy to stifle information. Mm. It doesn't have to be comfortable. People don't have to like it. People can get upset about it and they can start discussions and having conversations about this. That's the nature of a healthy democracy. I think without that, what we have is actually not an entirely healthy democracy. Um, Claudia wants to know, do we have evidence that free blacks in Maine worked in shipyards? If so, where might that evidence be located? Citizen historians in Kennebunk are searching for this evidence. Okay, great question. I will, you should email me or rather email Maine Maritime Museum's collections manager who I can put you in touch with so email me um, because yeah they they black Americans did work at shipyards in Maine and continue to work at shipyards in Maine there's a prominent time in the early 1900s when the coal schooners were a big thing where a lot of wharf workers as well as mariners on these coal schooners were entirely African-American crews or black crews from elsewhere in the world like Caribbean islands. Um, but yes, absolutely. And I would be happy to point you in the direction where you can find some of that information. Thank you. We have, uh, Susan is sharing some resources. She says, thank you so much for this important talk. Two relevant books on a parallel line of history are The Kidnapping Club, Wall Street Slavery and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War by Jonathan Daniel Wells 
and the president and freedom fighter, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and the battle to save America's soul by Brian Kilmeade. So I wanted to make sure those were said aloud for people who are watching the recording of these. Um, again, we have 20 something questions still, but I'm, <laughs> I'll just skip through it and choose a few more. Uh, Jonathan wanted to know, what was the presidential vote in 1860 in Bath? Oh man, great question. I'm sorry, Jonathan, I do not know. Um, I know that in 1816 Bath, Bath had a notorious reputation as a cotton town, which is why we named our exhibit Cotton Town. Mm -hmm. I know at that time that Brunswick also had a reputation as being the terminus of the Underground Railroad. So there's, it's kind of interesting that towns right next to each other had these different political divides, or at least mm -hmm reputations. I do not know actually what that election result was, but I wish that I had been smart enough to look that up. It's a mm -hmm. great point, and I'm going to do it after this. Um, Nancy says she's giving us another, um, another resource. She said, a book called Lives of Consequence tells about slave owners in Maine. I am a descendant of the Pepperell family. The information that they owned slaves stunned me a few years ago. So thank you, Nancy, for providing that resource. Um, Rosa is asking, oh, Rosamund is asking, have you seen box shooks being shipped to the Caribbean? I have a feeling they may have been shipped there uh, for boxing up sugar or rum bottles for return to New England. I'm not sure. Box, box shooks? Box shooks. I'm not, I'm sure. not familiar. So I'm that's not. that's my fault. Sorry, but. No, it's quite all right. You um, can, yeah, prob probably. It seems like something that would have happened. Um, Heather is asking, in addition to the Plains community in the Warren area, there was a community named Peterborough, and then she's provided a link there for people who are interested in doing that. Um, we have another statement. I wonder if there was any archaeological work done on the Plains community site when the construction of Cook's Corner Mall was being built. Uh, do you know anything about that? No, I think it's pretty unlikely. Mm. And it's in that area. I, I was being kind of dramatic with the picture of Sears. But yeah, that's that's the whole area right along the Androscoggin there, closer to the river. Um, it, it runs down the Air Force Base is there now too. So there were cabins scattered throughout, primarily inhabited by Black Americans. And some white Americans also had their homesteads in that community or on the fringes. Mm. Um, I'm going to go with two more questions and then we'll wrap up because there's just there's so many wonderful questions here and I apologize if I'm able to get to all of them. Um, uh, so uh, Jonathan says, Castine sold, um, Castine sold its fleet during the Civil War to Germany. How involved in the cotton or slave trade was Castine? Mm -hmm. I do not know off the top sure. of my head, but I know that it was a big shipbuilding town. So I imagine at the time that there were shipyards in there who were trying to get some piece of the cotton pie. So I would imagine that in the early 19th century, there were a lot of cotton ships being built in casting. Again, I have not done that research, but that would be my estimation. All right, thank you. Well, I think this, this last question is um, a good way to, to round it out. Um, Angela wants to know, can you share any practices around sitting with painful history in an embodied way, like how you remember the physical reality behind the documents, the way you slowed down when naming the names uh, and ages felt like one practice. I wonder if you could share about this and how, if it came up in your relationship with the materials and research and process. Do you have any anything you would like to say about that? Sure. I think doing the research, I think I feel fortunate to have been able to been in the archive, spent so many hours actually thumbing through pages and transcribing letters and working with a volunteer at the museum who's really good at reading through old documents to help me through some of the tough language. These documents are written in pretty messy handwriting sometimes, very archaic handwriting, and actually moving through them so slowly allowed me to kind of sit with them. And I, I think that's a benefit of doing this hard primary source analysis research 
And it's something that I try to encourage students to do as well is actually, I know they can't read cursive anymore, which is kind of <laughs> funny, but you know, help them try. So I'll give a cursive alphabet so that they can really slowly go through in word by word, letter by letter, start to piece together what actually happened. And it's shocking and it's astonishing, but the slower you interpret this material, I think it really sits with you. And I know it kind of permeated, still does, the way that I view Maine. When I go on a hike, I think about the lumbering industry. When I walk through town, I think about the mansions and the captain's houses. I don't think necessarily anymore that I, I consider that in a super negative way. Maybe I should, but it's it's a part of this history that's very real. And I think I feel very fortunate to have been able to go through the documents. Um, but yeah, it's probably different for every person, I guess. It's a really good question. Well, thank you so much, Luke. We appreciate um, this presentation more than you could possibly know. Uh, I know that this was some tremendous amount of engagement from our audience tonight. And again, I apologize if I wasn't able to get to all of the, um, the questions, but I will be sending some follow-up resources and again, a link to this so that you can share this program with others because this is incredibly important information that um, we should we should distribute. Um, Luke, thank you for the work that you're doing at the museum. Thank you for all that the Maine Maritime Museum does. And uh, I hope we get an opportunity to have programs from you again in the future. Definitely, thank you very much, Julia. And thank you all for your, your great questions and your attention and support. Wonderful. Again, I wanna mention that I'm, I'm just synthesizing research. There, there are people really doing these deep dives and you can be one of them, so. All right, everyone, thank you again for attending tonight, and I hope that you continue to attend our programs. These are very important discussions that we're having, and I look forward to in the fall, we'll be able to have more of them in person again, um, and we can have these, these conversations um, face to face. But in the meantime, you can check out librarycamden.org to find out everything that we have coming up, and I hope to see you all again very soon, and wish you a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Good night, Luke. Good night, thanks.